Every one of them had a bigger resume than him, but how did he get elected into being a president? Because back in 2004, a guy named Ron Paul raised $6 million for his presidential candidacy. Welcome back to Young Smart Money with me, your host, Apple Kreider. This is an episode of the podcast that I have been excited for for a very long time. Okay, today we're sitting down with Patrick Bet David. This guy runs the Valuetainment channel on YouTube, which now has uh, somewhere about 1.2 million subscribers to it and has received over a billion hours of watch time, which is just absolutely crazy to think about. I wanted to have Patrick on the podcast because he has a lot more life experience than some of the guests that I have on the show. Um, at this point in time, he's around 40 years old, which is significantly higher than the uh, median age of guests on Young Smart Money, but he's got a ton of life experiences. This dude's grown some massive, massive businesses, both on social media and in the world of insurance. So I wanted to allow him to come on the show, share his story, and really give you guys some valuable insights from somebody who's been in the game for a while now, because interviewing young guys, interviewing like 19 year olds who are making millions of dollars on Shopify is great, but hearing from people who have time in the world of entrepreneurship and business for a little bit longer um, can always be extremely valuable. And especially when you're talking to somebody at the caliber that Patrick Bet David is at, this dude brings the heat for sure. So I'm super stoked to get into the episode. I don't want to waste any more of your time though. So we're going to welcome Patrick on to the show. So wherever you guys are listening to the podcast at, I want you guys to sit back, relax, plug in, and enjoy this episode of Young Smart Money. All right, Pat, welcome to Young Smart Money. How are you doing today? I'm doing very good. It's good to be on with you. It is a pleasure to have you here. So, Pat, you need no introduction, even though I gave you one about 30 seconds ago, but our listeners, if they're not super familiar with you, give us like a 30 to 60 second intro as to what you're currently doing right now. Yeah, so I was born and raised in Iran, lived there 10 years. We escaped. I went to Germany. I went to Germany, lived at a refugee camp for two years, came to the States, joined the army, wanted to be a bodybuilder, got out of a... a the bodybuilding world, I'm too tall to be Mr. Olympia, I'm like 6'5", so uh, I knew you had to be like 5'8", 5'9", 5'10". I went into finance the day before 9-11, started working at Morgan Stanley Dean Witter, got my Series 7, kind of like you're a personal finance major. I got my Series 7, 66, 31, 26, Life and Health. Worked at Morgan for a year, worked at Transamerica for seven and a half years. October of 09, started our own insurance company with 66 agents out of one office. Today we have over 10,000 agents. 49 states. De La Hoya is one of my investors. Gabriel Brenner is one of my investors. And Adelaide Fund, which is a $2 billion fund out of New York, is one of our investors. And at the same time, I started a YouTube channel um, that uh, first year, I think we got 100, 200 subs. Second year, we got 1,000 subs. And then it went to 20,000, 100,000, 500,000. And today, we have 1.2, 1.3 million subs with a billion minutes wide. So that's my story. Amazing, man. I'm super stoked to dive into it. So we do have a younger listener base here. So I want to flash back a little bit. Talk about like your high school years. Okay. We have a lot of high school listeners. So at that time period, were you entrepreneurial? Were you taking school seriously? Clearly there was a lot going on in your life. Um, what was that time period like high school for you? So, you know, we were having this conversation the other day, with my family and what my life would look like if I had a little bit more stability in our home, because my parents got a divorce and I just didn't want to be home. I, mm. I, my goal was to do whatever I could to just not be home. Uh, it wasn't the most exciting time uh, to be home. And so I was in the streets all the time. I didn't have good grades. I got a job at 14 years old. I lied on my application and I started working at 14. I was tall, so they hired me. They thought I was 16. <laughs> I worked at haagen at Glendale Galleria. Hmm. And then uh, I would go to school in two backpacks. One backpack was uh, books and the other backpack was hats. I would buy baseball hats of losing teams, teams that didn't have the best uh, records for 99 cents and I would sell the hats for seven bucks, uh, two for 12, one for seven. And then, uh, that's what I did. I always had cash. I'd go uh, middle of the night when my family was asleep. I'd go, I had a shopping cart right behind the, our apartment complex. I would hide and I would go on a trail since 13 years old. I would do this and I would collect beer bottles and cans and I'd go to Albertsons and Vons and I would recycle. And that's how I bought my baseball cards prior to having a job. So you know, you know, math was easy to me. I uh, had a very easy time with math, but uh, everything else, I just, you had to be a good teacher to really catch my attention because I really didn't pay attention in school and I didn't do, do well uh, with authority as a young uh, teenager. Hmm. So you really just wanted that freedom to, to do your own thing? Absolutely. One of the main reasons why we left Iran is because you didn't have freedom. And so I wanted to be left alone. Let me get to work. And uh, what's weird is right afterwards joining the army, like it's the complete opposite because in the yeah. army you have, you know, 
you're working 18 hours every day, you know, every single day you're working. And so, but that order and that discipline was needed for a guy like me. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. So after coming out of the army, um, you ended up opening that insurance practice. Um, clearly was that like the first like actual like business you'd started that wasn't like selling hats at school? No, I started a couple of, I had a, you know, I would sell supplements when I was in the army. I had a, a, a locker full of su- supplements. I would buy from a wholesaler and I would sell it retail for a lot of the military guys on base that come and buy creatine from me, HMB, V2G, amino acids, protein shakes. I had all these different kinds of things in my uh, barracks. But uh, prior to starting the insurance company, I, I used to sell 100 page websites back in 1999. And uh, I did a couple other online things selling portals. Uh, and then eventually I dated a girl named Jean Beer who worked at Morgan Stanley Dean Wood. And she told me about uh, Morgan Stanley Dean Wood and I started working there. Awesome. So, so what made you transition from working at Morgan Stanley to starting your own practice? So for Morgan, I went to Transamerica okay. and then from Transamerica, I started uh, my own practice. What made me transition out? One, uh, I worked at a company who had great leaders, but at the top of the company in their home office, it was led by this one woman who had more control than any of the other leaders and she dictated everything. And I just didn't like the way the corporate office treated the, the advisors and she, her name was Susan. And she was one of the main reasons why I went from being an intrapreneur to an entrepreneur. If it wasn't for Susan, I would have never left the company. She was my number one reason for leaving that company and becoming an entrepreneur. That's huge. So did you have any mentors in the insurance field or anyone you were looking up to or learning from when it came to starting your own practice? I had a lot as of how to sell and build an agency Mm. and, and teach my sales guys. But I had no example of watching somebody how to build a company. And that's a whole different thing. I mean, we probably went out of business, close to going out of business a couple hundred times. It, was, uh, it wasn't an easy thing for the first couple of years. The good news, the, probably the best thing I had going on was the day we started a company, I held a meeting and I told everybody, I said, here's what you need to know about me. My entire life savings that I've saved up, up to being 29, 30 years old, is going into the company. I don't have an option B. Uh, I'm not looking at another job. I'm not buying a house for five years. I'm putting every single penny I have in the business, every penny I have in a business. And so if you fail and the company shuts down, no one here loses more than I do. No one does. You will lose, but you're not losing as much as I am. So my pain of loss is way more than your pain of loss. So if you decide to follow and work with me, just know that I don't have another alternative. I'm all in. And, and that, that uh, created a lot of fear, a lot of urgency to make sure I got things done. What pushed you to go all in? Like, why, why are you putting all these eggs in this basket? I didn't, I didn't like the alternative. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't like the alternative to have to uh, constantly play politics and uh, have to kiss someone's ass to get things my way. Just not my, I'm not a fan of it. I'm a fan of let me go perform based on merit. If I earn it, let me do what I do and don't play the political games with me. I just, I'm not a... I've never in my life done well with people that play games, never. Uh, And a lot of times, unfortunately, in the corporate world, a lot of people are driven more by power than they're driven by influence and leadership. And when you are working with somebody that's only driven by power and politics, and you're driven by uh, leadership and merit, you're going to bump it. So one of those two has to disappear. So I realized they're not going to get rid of her. I'll make it easy on them. I decided to leave. Mm. Very true. So you said from the beginning, you had sort of a staff already, you had people that were already part of this company. Um, What made you decide to to start actually building it out before you even started it? Yeah, so no, I had a, 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 I had a reputation, a marketplace at that time, you knew who I was. Uh, I had a, 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 I was doing okay for myself. I was making a very good income. A a lot of people were uh, surprised that I left. My life wasn't, I had a much better life uh, than than I did when I left because when you're there, I don't have to worry about compliance. I don't have to worry about hiring, firing, uh, legal attorneys, NDAs, NCAs, finance, banking, you know, uh, uh, audited financials. I didn't have to worry about going through payroll, uh, uh, human resources, state laws, city laws, county laws, county taxes, city taxes. I don't have to worry about any of that stuff. You just go out there and build your book of business. Yeah, It's very easy to do that. But when we started a company, you know, the responsibility went to a whole different place. And so because I had a, a, a reputation in the marketplace I was at, I was able to attract some people that wanted to work with me. Hmm. 
So clearly in that prior experience, you had a lot of, of, of sales of ability. Like you were able to, to really, like, like you said, build your book of business and have some success with that. So for the younger listeners, I get a lot of people telling me they're getting involved in sales. Do you have any advice for somebody who's getting involved in their first sales position, maybe 18, 19, 20 years old, um, things that they can start to implement to be more effective? Yeah, I mean, the first thing I would tell you is shadow. You know, find somebody worth shadowing. If you can get somebody that you shadow, you have... Uh, you can give me a guy that's read a thousand business books, mm -hmm. but never worked with somebody to shadow that's incredible at what they do. And you give me somebody else that's read 20 sales books, 20 business books, but they've, they've been able to shadow three of the best to ever do it. This person's going to crush the guy that's read a thousand books. You, you, this is one of the reasons why I see a lot of college students come out and they go in the marketplace and uh, they make 50, 60, 70, 80, 150, 200, 300 grand a year. They think they're doing good. And you got another guy that doesn't have a college degree, doesn't have all the books they read, all the psychology books, you know, physics, calculus, all of those books that you read for having a four year degree. And they've never been able to, you know, they've been able to shadow somebody else. They've been able to work under somebody else. They're making millions. The college students only making 60, 70, 80. So it has nothing to do with how many books, how many textbooks, how many degrees you get. It has to do with who you shadow. If you're mm -hmm. able to shadow somebody great, you have an edge over somebody else that's read 50,000 books. Absolutely. So do you have any advice as far as like finding that person to shadow um, that, that a young person could go out there and, and find somebody who could really like show them the way? How'd you get a hold of me? <laughs> Instagram. Why, why did I say yes to you? Honestly, how'd you get a hold of me? I mean, you, 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 you teach us. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't, how, how old are you yourself? I'm 20 years old. Okay. You're 20 years old. You got a hold of me. So how'd you get a hold of me? Um, I think I went through your assistant, shot some emails um, back and forth for a little while, and then and then we lined it up. Did you message me on Instagram or LinkedIn? Where do we? Connect? I think I started with Instagram. So you started on Instagram. Yeah. And then finally you got the attention, and then uh, you were able to get to the assistant, and you were, you were able to book it, right? Yep. So now watch where you're at. This same ability, you know, people are out there. You know, you you got to realize that when I saw your message, and I saw your hair, and I saw a couple of your videos. I say, this guy's got personality. He's different. He's not afraid. He's not trying to be like everybody else. He's 20 years old doing a podcast, doing a video. You know what? If I was his age and he's actually making an effort and he's actually gotten some people, I'll give him the time of day. So think about me. I judged you to see how serious you are. Then I decided to say yes to you. So it's not like now 50 people are going to send me a message and say, Pat, will you do my podcast? Probably not because it has to be somebody that has shown a level of seriousness. Like you got to go earn your stripes in the marketplace for somebody to say, I'll give this person an opportunity to do so. But let me go back and talk about how to find somebody to shadow. So think about it this way. Everybody wants to go work under Buffett first. Oh, I'd love to go work under Buffett. I'd love to go work under Cuban. I'd love to work under, hey, Pat, hire me today. I'd love to go work under this social media guy that's killing it. Or, you know, this Hollywood uh, person that's doing very well. Mm -hmm. And they forget that you can go work with a local guy making a half a million a year. That's the best salesperson locally. And you can pick up a lot of habits there. And then when you get to their level, then you go talk to the $2 million guy, $10 million guy, $50 million guy. I think the first guy I went and shadowed um, was a uh, 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 first guy I shadowed was a guy named uh, Cisco. Okay. Cisco Davis. He was a sales manager at Valley Total Fitness. He was amazing. I was able to shadow him. He never made a lot of money, but he taught me sales because he was a great sales teacher and a great sales guy. So I would sit there and listen to the way he was selling. Then I shadowed another guy, Gabriel, at a mall. I said, wow, this guy's got a lot of audacity in the mall to go up to people and talk to them. Then a guy named Brian, then a guy named Marlon, then a guy. There were so many people that I was shadowing and it was constantly coming up. And then the people I started shadowing became bigger. They became billionaires. They became uh, politicians. They became people that have done very, very well. They became athletes who have made it to the highest level. But regardless of it, you got to find somebody locally that's willing to put the time into somebody like you. And if they say yes, let's just say they do give you the opportunity to run from somebody like that. You got to do whatever you can to earn every single second of their time to work with them. No complaining, no bitching, no whining, no but. No, but I got to go to the club Friday night, man. I'm, I came to work with smoking weed. I smell like I'm high with my eyes are red, but I'll take the visine. None of that bullshit. You got to be serious. And if you are serious, they'll keep you around. Mm, that's the truth. And, and like you said, man, making yourself a person of value is so important because like if I would have just hit you up and not had done anything, like had no content, had no name, had, had done nothing, like you would have never given me your time a day. So I, I, think I, I probably would have. Right. 
Mm, that's so key. So, so now you've got this insurance practice that, that you started up. Talk to us about some of the biggest challenges that you were facing at first. Like some, what were some of the roadblocks that you had to overcome at this early stage? We have a lot of early stage entrepreneurs here. Um, what are some of the things that they're likely going to encounter starting off? You know, it's, it's the stuff you don't know about. Like it's the blind spots. It's the stuff that nobody prepared you. You know, it's like everybody wants to uh, uh, marry early. Oh my gosh, I love my girl. I want to marry her. No, you don't. You, you, you're thinking you want to get married. I promise you, you do not want to be married in your early 20s, mid 20s. You want to take your time till you're in your 30s to get married, especially nowadays with Tinder being so accessible to you and <laughs> sex is not a big deal. No, sex is really not a big deal today as much as it was 20 years ago. 20 years ago, you had to learn how to close and go prospect and talk to a woman and follow up. And today you don't need to follow up. You just got to swipe right and play the numbers game. And eventually, eventually it's going to work out for you. Sex is not a big deal today. So in the, in the world of, uh, in the world of business, like when you're first getting started, same as marriage, same as being a parent, like, Oh my gosh, it's so cute. Look at that baby. I just want a baby. I bet if I have a baby, my life will change for the better. Life will change for the better, but life will also change for the worse because you are not going to have a lot of the flexibilities and freedoms that you have. And then there are things that no one prepped you on. No one told you you're gonna only sleep two hours a night. No one told you, you know, you still gotta to get to work even with an hour and a half of sleep and them throwing up on you and they're sick all the time. You're sick all the time. Your wife is sick all the time. Everybody's transferring the sickness all the time and so many different things. And so people don't tell you that story. Business, when you first get started with business, there are so many things you don't know. 90% of the things about starting a business you don't know. And then all of a sudden you're surprised here, surprised there, surprised here. So one of the things that is going to give you an advantage is to make sure you have people around you that are five steps ahead of you. They can ask you, what did you do when you were in this step? What did you do when you went through this? Become a big student, pick topics and start studying them. Uh, if it's taxes, if it's accounting, if it's operation, if it's scaling, if it's hiring, if it's firing, if it's investments, if it's equity, if it's breakdown of salary, pay, sales comp, culture, structure, you got to go study all those things to be able to make sure your business goes to the next level. That's if you're running a business, not online store, affiliate marketing. I don't really consider that as a running a real business. I run that as a, a independent contractor, you're a salesperson, you're making money on the side. I'm talking about yeah. running a business where people come to the office, you're hiring, firing, scaling, raising money. I'm talking about that. Mm, absolutely. So now, now talk to us a little bit about that transition that you made from the insurance to, to like creating content online, because now you have this huge online presence, like you mentioned earlier. Um, and, and it sounded like that was like, it took a lot of time for that to build up to where it is eventually now. So why did you decide to get started making content online? Well, you know, you're living in a world today where if you don't control the narrative, everybody else is going to say who you are. Mm. You got to go control the narrative. One of the reasons why uh, Trump is the most hated president in the world because he controls the narrative. He goes and tells the world who he is. He immediately goes up and tells the world who he is. And one of the reasons why Barack Obama became a president over a McCain or over a Romney or over a Hillary Clinton, every one of them had a bigger resume than him. But how did he get elected into being a president? Because back in 2004, a guy named Ron Paul raised six million dollars for his presidential candidacy on myspace let me say this one more time he raised six million dollars in 24 hours on myspace were you ever on myspace were you on myspace ever or no nope. you're shaking your head and you're 20 years old right myspace myspace was before facebook before any of these guys right and when he raised six million dollars in 04 obama's sitting there saying what the hell just happened what do you mean he raised six million dollars in 24 hours I'm cooler, I'm better looking, I'm younger, I'm more attractive. What if I do this? I'm only a one-term senator. And Obama went out there and he realized the power of social media. And through the power of social media, he became a two-term president. And Trump, through the power of social media, never having been involved in politics, became a president because they control the narrative. So today, you ask the question, why did I get into social media? I started realizing, uh, when you build a business, people wanna know two things. Who's the company? and who's the person behind the company. They wanna know who the founder is. They don't wanna just know who the company is. They wanna know who's the founder, what does he think about? What are his opinions? What does he stand for? Maybe I like him, maybe I don't like him. Maybe he's a sports guy, maybe he's a golf guy. I don't care for golf guys. I don't care for sports guys. This guy's too political, this guy's about this. He's too much about faith. Or he's not enough about faith. Or he doesn't talk enough about politics because he's hiding something. But you have a way of knowing who the founder is. 
Mark Cuban, whether you like him or not, you know who he is. So you know the brand behind all of his businesses, right? You know, whether you like uh, a, a, an Elon Musk or not, you know he went and smoked pot on Joe Rogan's show, and he's like, listen, this is who I am, you know, and it kind of took a hit for the company, but everyone knows Elon Musk, and they keep following this guy. It was the same with Jobs. It was the same with a lot of these guys that people do business with. So in today's world, the, the days of wanting to be the quiet guy behind closed doors, that actually creates more concerns for the consumer because the consumer is wondering if you're hiding something. Versus you come out and say, this is who I am. They say, well, you know what? He's pretty transparent. I like him. So I, I was a pretty private guy for many years. I uh, grew up in a family where it was all about private. Don't tell your business to people how much money you have, what you're doing, all this other stuff. And that was like a Middle Eastern cultural thing. But you see things are changing, adapting. And if you don't say it, people are going to make up. People started telling stories that the reason why, you know, our insurance company grew as fast as it did is because I have oil money. I come from an oil family. My family's a billionaire. And you know, Pat comes from so much money, no one knows about it. And he has access to this. And, you know, one of the rumors was Pat's connected to the CIA. And I, that was one of my, those two rumors were one of my favorite rumors. I'm like, I'm connected to the CIA. That makes a lot of sense to me. <laughs> to the point where one day I go home for a vacation, my dad pulls me aside and he sits me down and says, I want to ask you a question. You don't have to answer it. You can wink if you want. But I need to know if you're part of the CIA. I said, Dad, are you being serious right now? He said, no, I really need to know. I called my sister. I said, are you guys pulling a prank? He says, what are you talking about? He really thought, I, because it became his phenomenon. He started buying it. And my dad's uh, my best friend in the world. But the point I'm trying to make to you is this. You are doing the right thing by starting early. Your peers have to start as well. Because if the world doesn't like, if I'm hiring you, if I'm hiring you, you're, you want to go into finance. Say you want to work at Morgan Merrill. Uh, what university you say going to Wisconsin? So what university are you going to? Uh, Wisconsin, Madison. Okay, so Wisconsin, Madison. So your uh, major is personal finance. Say you go after this and you get your MBA and you want to work at Goldman, Merrill, uh, uh, Morgan Stanley. I want to know who you are. So I'm going to go out there and research. I'm going to say, look, this guy's bold. He's, there. he's not afraid. Look at him on camera. He's pretty confident. He's going to be confident in networking, prospecting, talking to people. It's going to give me an element of audacity. I'm looking at your eyes. Your eyes have confidence behind them, right? There's a certain thing that you have. This becomes your resume versus... Hey, this is my resume. I was a 3.7 GPA at Wisconsin Madison, and I did some good for the community, and I worked on this charity, and I was a chess champion. No one cares about this. Not today. They care about how you can go out there and be noticed in today's marketplace. Your resume today is different than your resume was 20 years ago. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more with that. So for like the 16, 17, 18 year old who's listening right now, do you think that they should just start making content, just start like creating YouTube videos, podcasts, Instagram posts? Or do you think it's important for them to devote some time and energy into like making themselves a person of value before they start creating content? I, I, that's how I did it. Uh, I mean, you see the stuff behind me. Yeah. The, the bookshelf behind me says read, right? I mean, that's all books. I, I, I read 1,500 books. I sold. I won. I lost. I failed. Uh, I went into a lot of different circles. So by the time I started creating content, here's the first thing people started saying. They started saying, huh, who is this guy? Okay, he, he looks like uh, the character from Prison Break. Okay, he's bald, he kind of looks intimidating, but he looks like he knows what he's talking about with business. That's kind of confusing. Did he say he's from Iran? Wait a minute, an Iranian is talking about entrepreneurship and finance? It's just kind of a very confusing here, but, but he knows what he's saying. But that also made sense. But wow, I agree with that. Interesting, I never thought about it that way. And so the value kept people coming back after questioning the way I look like I'm from the movie Prison Break. They came back because value was there. You got to realize value was there. So what you're saying is I agree with, although today, you know, there's a lot of people that are creating a reputation for themselves because I met this Iranian guy, genius kid. He's got a YouTube channel with 6 million subs, 7 million subs. And on only 55 videos, by the way, only 55 videos, 6 million subs. I said, how'd you get to 6 million subs? He created prank videos. You know, the whole shampoo thing you put on the head and the beach and the girls keep washing their hair and they're thinking, how come the shampoo's not going away? That's him. Okay. So, but when you talk to him, extremely professional, he doesn't look like a prankster guy, right? He looks like a guy that's well-read, very smart, but that got him 3 billion views. Listen, more power to him for getting 3 billion views. People see the humor side of him. So there's a lot of ways today to do things. I mean, listen, for the 16, 17 year old, one of the things you got to realize is you have access to more things today than ever before. You are brainwashed 
into thinking a lot of things are okay today with drugs, alcohol, a lot of that stuff, which is going to hurt many people because they're going to waste a lot of their years. But at the same time, I will also say this other part. It is so easy for a 16, 17-year-old today. Let, let me make this prediction to you. Mm -hmm. A 16, 17-year-old today who says, I'm going to take this thing so seriously the next 20 years, and then I'm going to run for office at 35. We will have a 35, 37-year-old president in the next 20, 30 years just because of social media. It's a complete different ballgame. We will have a 35-year-old president in the next 20, 30 years just because of social media. But it's the 16, 17-year-old watching this today that says, you know what? All the bad habits, all the things that hurts people and all the things that makes people lose momentum or completely lose five years of their life, three years of their life, six years of their lives, I'm not going to be doing that. I'm going to get a little bit more discipline. By the way, don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about don't have your fun. I'm not talking about don't go out there and experience a little bit of that. I, I would say do whatever you can to avoid any of this stuff that can completely ruin momentum for you. But uh, the sooner you get clear about what you want to do with your life as a 16, 17-year-old, you have an edge. In Europe, when I went to school in Germany, they asked 10th uh, graders already what they want to do with their careers. 10th. a 10th grade. They already want you to know what you're doing with your career. And because of that, your curriculum changes based on what you want to do with your life. Now, it sounds a little crazy because you're like, what 10th grader really knows what they want to do with their lives? But it, it allows you to say, if it's law and you want to be a lawyer, your, grade, your classes in 11th grade and senior are around becoming a lawyer. If it's finance, it changes. So earlier on, you're being conditioned on what career you want to do. The sooner that 16, 17-year-old can figure out what they want to do with their lives and they're able to minimize the amount of mistakes they can make and advance themselves, they'll have an edge over the marketplace. And then obviously, once you create content, everybody wants to know who you are. Hmm. That's, that's, so, that's so huge. Now, Pat, I have some questions that I'd like to ask all of my guests before we wrap up the show. Are you feeling ready for those? Go for it. Awesome. The first thing I'm curious about is what is something that genuinely has you excited? This could be in your business, in the wider realm of, of really content, insurance, anything. But what's something that genuinely has you excited right now? So I'm a fan of the unknown. I'm a big fan of the unknown. The more unknown projects I have going on, the more enthusiasm it creates in me. Let's, let me explain to you what I mean by this. Mm -hmm. Unknowns are like, uh, I have a book that's a fiction book I wrote. It took me five years to write it. I will not publish it until I leave being a CEO of the company because it's pretty controversial. That is very exciting because it's an unknown. Uh, we just announced the speakers for our annual convention that will be in August in Las Vegas. We've already sold 10,301 tickets for this con conference. We'll have over 10,000 people at this conference. Our keynote speakers are Billy Bean, who's the guy from Moneyball with Brad Pitt, Jordan Peterson, which you may know who Jordan Peterson is. And then we announced Kobe Bryant will be at our conference. And then we also announced President Bush will be at our conference. That's our conference. Yeah, 10,300 people is our conference. That's unknown. I'm excited about 2020 Vault Conference. Last one we had uh, two weeks ago, we had people that attended the first Vault Conference, which is for entrepreneurs, executive startup founders. People showed up on 43 different countries, attended the first Vault Conference. I'm excited about the 2021 we'll be, we'll be doing in June to see how many will show up, where it will be, how many different countries. We've already sold out. Uh, um, we announced 50 of the highest package CEO. We sold 66. It's already sold out. So all the other packages would be, I'm, I'm excited about that. I'm working on a book right now. I got my uh, uh, guy coming in town from uh, New York for us to work on this project together for the rest of the day today. He'll be in town. But, but the part about answering your question for you is excitement to me comes from having a lot of different things that are cooking for you that are unknowns that could have a very big victory. Too many times, if everything is just so stable, where it's so much of a groundhog day where life is the same every single day, it doesn't produce excitement. I like unknowns, and we got a lot of unknowns today. So off of that, um, I'm just curious. I see a lot of young people bouncing around between like eight different business models at once, and they have a lot of things on their plate. So how do you personally deal with having all those things on your plate, whether they be unknowns or just different projects that you're working on? Yeah, so it's all to solve for one thing. Okay. All of it is going around one thing. So it's not like I'm doing 50 different businesses. I'm not, different, I'm not a fan of 50 different businesses at all. Remember, my bread and butter is insurance. I don't make money off YouTube. So people say, well, you know, Patrick makes his money off YouTube. I have all internal editors. I have all internal designers. I have a whole production team. I put a million and a half into YouTube. And I haven't made a million and a half off YouTube. Not even, not even a third of it have I made uh, off YouTube. You know, but it's all of it is 
solving for an issue. As far as my financial firm goes, that's 99% of what I'm doing. I don't have, uh, I'm not a fan of, you know, investing in a lot of different places. I want to build one thing. I saw a lot of young guys. When he said that, the young guys coming up, you know, they do eight different careers because, so you got to realize why that is. Let me explain it this way. Mm -hmm. Think about the coolest guy online that's gotten the attention of most kids who are 16, 17 year olds. Don't give any names. Just think about those names. Okay. Mm -hmm. These are single guys. They can't be married because married guys are boring to 16, 17, 18, 20 year olds. Think about it. A married guy is not exciting for you. You, you would be more uh, excited about the 25 year old Pat that was in Vegas every other weekend and uh, 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 you know, with every other girl in, in the world in Vegas and he's having, that would be exciting to you. But this Patrick is like one girl. He's got three kids. Blah. That's boring. Give me a flipping break. I don't care. You show me books. Show me some chick. I want to see some butts. I want to see some, you know what I'm saying? So think about the guys that are getting the attention of 16, 17, 18, 20, 22 year olds. What are they selling? They're selling sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And that's marketing. That's what they're selling, right? And they're selling multiple streams of income. They're selling, you should have eight different businesses, 20 different businesses. Mm -hmm. But why are people listening to them? Because there's big butts in the camera and big breasts. And I don't have big butts and big, big breasts in the camera. I just don't. Uh, uh, maybe I should have start having like two, three, four girls behind me that they pose a little bit for the content to be a little bit more sexy. But, but there's a part of it where you have to realize and ask yourself, am I listening to this guy because he actually knows what he's talking about? Am I listening to this guy because that peach in the back looks gorgeous and I'm turned on by this. So I'll pay attention to him as well. And I'm listening to him having eight different businesses. I'll go start eight different businesses. Mm -hmm. Elon Musk started a business. He sold it. Then he started another business. Then he sold it. Then he started another business. Then he sold it. Then he started another business. And then when he's worth 22 billion, then he has three different companies. But it's not coming up having three different companies. Cuban came up selling one business at a time. Now he's Shark Tank because he's worth $4 billion. It's a different story. But when you're coming up for your first or two big victories, the key is to have one business, not eight different. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Pat, do you have any habits that have served you particularly well? Just things you do on a routine basis? Uh, I'm a numbers guy. My, one of the habits I will tell you is I look for trends in everything. I'm, I'm all about trends. So, I, 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 you know, uh, you give me a report with numbers. I will look like everything on my desk. I'll just show you what's sitting on my desk so you know. Like I like weird reports. Everything to me is data. Everything to me is numbers. Everything to me is just, I got data all over the place on my desk. I'm a data guy. I'm a data junkie. And the reason why I like numbers is because people lie. Numbers don't lie. <laughs> you know, uh, people can get up there and tell you how amazing of a job they're doing. You give me their numbers and what they're doing. Numbers tell a great story. I'll give you a perfect example. I had one of my guys whose sales had dropped, okay? And I questioned his work ethic. And he says, what are you talking about? I'm one of the hardest working people. I said, I don't think you're working hard. I think you're making, we're paying you $500,000 per year. And I think you stopped working like two years ago. And we're still paying you $500,000 of your income. He says, you don't know what you're talking about. I said, really? I said, okay. I said, uh, what's your closing ratio? I said, if you sit with a client to sell an insurance policy or an annuity, what's your closing ratio? I'm one of the best. Okay, so what's your closing ratio? He said, I am a 60% closing ratio. I said, wow, 60%. He said, I'm 60%. I said, no problem. I said, if you were 60% closing ratio, um, how many appointments would you say you run per week? I run at least 10 appointments per week. Really? Yes. I said, is there any way why in the last three months you have only sold four policies? If you're a 60% closing ratio, that tells me you've only ran eight appointments. And you ran eight appointments in the last three months. And eight appointments in the last three months divided by 12 weeks means you barely run one appointment a week. You told me you were 60% closing ratio. What happened there? Silence. Numbers never lie. And if there's one thing I pay very, very close attention to is data everywhere. Mm. That's huge, man. That's huge. So I know you're putting out a ridiculous amount of content across all your different social media platforms. Is there any content you're consuming right now, whether that's books, audiobooks, podcasts, other YouTube channels? Yeah. So, so it, you know, a lot of times it has to do with what topics I'm working on. Like right now, it's yeah. all about uh, uh, leadership development and uh, a lot of finance. Like it's boring stuff I'm reading right now. It's not stuff that's exciting for people to announce what it is. Uh, uh, it, you know, it's how to read term sheets and, you know, like that's not going to be exciting for anybody. But it depends on the phase I'm going through. Like the way I do things is 
I'll pick a topic, I'll pick a word and I'll just study it. Like if I go sales, I'll read 40 books on sales. If it's, you know, insurance, I'll read 30 books on insurance. If it's stocks, I'll read 20 books on stocks. If it's negotiation, I'll read 40 books on negotiation. I don't, I go words at a time. I go mm-hmm. words at a time. So my suggestion, if you're reading, you know how everybody tells you, you should read this book, you should read this book, you should read this book, you should read this book. You should be very careful to take every book people recommend you because you ought to go topic by topic by topic by topic by topic. Immerse yourself with a subject to study, then go next, then go next, then go next. That'll develop you into a whole different level rather than waiting on people giving you 50 different book recommendations on 50 different topics. Absolutely. Now, Pat, one thing that I'm also super curious about as well with the guests that I have on the show is the things they do that they choose not to scale. So for example, I send a lot of video messages on Instagram to new followers, to people I want to connect with. And that's something that I choose not to scale. I don't bring a VA on to just send out videos of me all day to just new followers. Um, so is there anything for you that has that personal, like uh, Patrick, Bet David, one-on-one personal touch to it that, that you do in your business? Oh, so, so I'm, I, I, everything on Twitter is me. Nobody tweets back. So if you get a tweet back, it's 100% me. Instagram is 100% me. Uh, LinkedIn is 100% me. The only thing that's not 100% me is the Facebook fan page. That's not 100% me. That's probably 50% me. But everything else uh, is, if you get a comment back, it's not my team doing it. Like on Instagram, if somebody comments back, it's not my team doing it. It's me doing it, responding back to you. Um, wow. And a lot of time with that, it's, this is how I do it. I mean, you get on the treadmill for 45 minutes and for 45 minutes, you can respond back to all, a lot of messages. So if at night, you know, if I'm sitting there and I'm, you know, doing a, a, a exercise or routine or whatever I got, that's different. I'll sit there and respond back to some people. If I'm at the doctor's office, I got a 20 minute break. If I'm on a flight and I got internet, I can respond back to 600 messages. So I will generally respond back on those platforms. Wow. That's huge. So Pat, where can, where can our listeners go if they've been enjoying the mass amounts of value that you've been dropping and they want to connect with you? What's the best place to reach out, learn more about you and uh, valuetainment? I mean, Instagram, Twitter, I'll respond back to it's Patrick Bay, David. I'm sure you're going to leave the link below. Yep. Um, and then valuetainment YouTube, if you want to go consume the content there, watch the interviews with Kevin Hart, Mark Cuban, Steve Wozniak, a lot of different people. You can go on valuetainment on YouTube or type in the word entrepreneur. You'll see me all over the place, but I would say those three different platforms. Awesome. And I'll be sure to link up all of those in the show notes for this episode as well. Now, Pat, do you have any last closing thoughts, words of wisdom, or anything you want to wrap the show up here with today? Yeah. So if it's the 16, 17, 18 year old, 20 year old, this is what I would tell you is you're at a point right now where recruiting needs to start now. Let me explain what I mean by recruiting. If I was in school and I'm coming up and I know what I know today, I am recruiting a team together and we're talking about ideas of how we're going to conquer the world together. And it's a team of people that don't share common strengths, but they share common vision together. For example, say you're the personality guy and you know everybody, but I'm shy, but I'm very good with coding and you're not the best in coding. We would make a good team together, right? Say I have somebody that's got contacts to a community I don't have access to. I would go recruit her to the party. Say I have somebody that's come from a very rich family and they have a lot of money and the dad is in business, and if we need some investment, we can go to that dad and raise the money. That's an Edward to Mark Zuckerberg. Edward's dad gave the 18 grand. Edward today is worth six, seven billion dollars, so somebody needs to have access to the money. But my entire focus, if I'm 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 right now, is all about putting a killer team together and constantly selling each other on the vision of who, what we can be, who we can be one day, and then keep working on that and bringing more and more and more talent to that. It's all about building that community. A hundred percent guys, build up your Avengers squad, take over the world. Patrick, thank you so much for your time, man. I appreciate it. And I appreciate you choosing to spend here on Young Smart Money. It has been a pleasure. Great job, man. Keep at it. You're doing a great job yourself. Appreciate that. Thank you. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this latest episode of Young Smart Money and got a ton of value out of it. If you did, do not forget to subscribe to the podcast. It only takes about five seconds. If you're walking the dog, if you're going to the gym, pull that phone out of your pocket, press that subscribe button, and uh, drop us some love in the ratings and review sections as well. Those really do help the podcast get in front of even more people and helps us get even more amazing guests on the show. And I do read each and every one of your ratings, reviews, message that you send me 
uh, they, they really do impact me and the show and show me exactly what you want to be seeing here on Young Smart Money. So again, do not forget to drop us a rating, review, and subscribe over in iTunes. And guys, have a wonderful day. Take care. And I really do appreciate you choosing to spend your time here with us on Young Smart Money. Have a wonderful day. Real quick, just launched a new project called the Online Course Examiner, basically the Yelp of online courses. It is blowing up lately, onlinecourseexaminer.com. Check it out.